Welcome to AUC Author Series. In this series of programs, we interview the authors in the Atlanta University Center community and introduce you to their latest published works. This program is produced by Brad Oss and Daniel Lee. Our guest today is Dr. James Gillum, professor of history at Spelman College. Dr. Gillum will be discussing his most recent book, Life and Death in the Central Highlands, an American Sergeant in the Vietnam War, 1968 to 1970. This is a memoir of Dr. Gillum's service in Vietnam. Welcome to the Robert W. Woodruff Library, Atlanta University Center. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us today. Um, your latest book, uh, Life and Death in the Central Highlands, An American Sergeant in the Vietnam War, 1968-1970, um, this is your memoir about your personal experience during the Vietnam War. Can you give us uh, an overview of, of your latest work? Basically, this book starts with the Tet Offensive of 1968 because that was the watershed event in the war, and it also affected me personally. Um, as I said in the book, it... Um, it made that particular battle made space in the army uh, for a lot of draftees in 1968. Right. So I started with the Tet Offensive, and then uh, I worked myself into the book uh, since I was drafted to replace somebody who got lost in the offensive. And then the reader gets to follow me through training. Uh, basic training through the NCO Academy and uh, a short tour as a training sergeant in Alabama and then it's, it's off to Vietnam and Cambodia and it finally ends when uh, I got home and tried to resettle myself in as a civilian. Right, right. Um, you talked about a little bit about the Tet Offense in 1968. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more uh, about the Tet Offense from a political and a military perspective? I had the good fortune to interview General Tran Van Tron. Now, he was the Viet Cong general who uh, implemented the Tet Offensive. And so, in our conversations, I just said to him, what was the plan? What were you thinking? And he said, the idea was to break our will to war, to cause so many casualties that the political fallout would cause the withdrawal from Vietnam. And um, they struck almost every major city and major American military installation in the southern half of Vietnam uh, within 24 hours. Okay. Uh, so that was really what uh, made the government decide that we really had to get out. Right, right. From a military standpoint, did they achieve their goals? From a military standpoint, no. The other two parts of the plan were to embarrass the Arvin Army, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, right. and also to cause spontaneous uprisings against the Saigon government. Um, in some cases, they did embarrass Arvin, but they never got the spontaneous uprisings that they had planned for. Right. Well, from a political standpoint, in South Vietnam and also in uh, the U U.S. government at the time. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. You know, the, uh, an indication of how deeply they struck in the political realm is that Lyndon Johnson effectively resigned right, from the presidency. Right. right in uh, March of 1968, the casualties in the first three months of 1968 were actually higher than in the, the toughest years of World War II in the Pacific. We lost more men than In the first couple chapter, you talk about how you were an, a very easy, easy-going young man 
before you joined the, the boot camps in Fort Knox. Yeah. And that's when you were turned into basically a very aggressive um, soldier during boot camp in Fort Knox. In your book, you talk a little bit about the bully corporal. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, tell us what happened and what were you feeling at that Well, I still remember that incident. Uh, in basic training, you usually got more harassment from the lower ranks, the PFCs, the specialist fourth class, and the corporal. And this guy was a company clerk. And um, he was determined to make sure that uh, every brand new recruit ran full out every time he stepped outside of barracks. Mm -hmm. And um, I was had been I was on the way to the uh, company commander's office. Uh, I was a trainee squad leader. So I was trying to get a compassionate leave for one of my men. And uh, this corporal told me the CO wanted to see me. So I was walking across the street to um, kind of like rehearse my best plea to get this guy home to see his wife. She'd been in labor for like three days or something, you know, right. pretty bad. And this guy came up behind me and kicked me in the back of the ankle right on the Achilles. It really hurt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, while I was on my knees, he, you know, kind of got in my face and was yelling and just seemed like a good idea to hit him in the mouth, so I did. <laughs> and um, the drill sergeant, my drill sergeant broke it up and, you know, he, he knew what this guy was right. like. So he um, just said, okay, guys, save it for uh, pugil stick practice. And right. pugil stick practice is, is uh, the lead up to bayonet fighting. Yeah. And that kind of gets really intense. Right. And so uh, he said, you know, we'll, we'll work this out so when that comes. And so um, one of the things that we had been taught for bayonet practice is um, no mercy. Right. Ever. Right. So um, he kind of tried to use his, his weight and size advantage. And um, I m made him miss got him on the ground, and, you know, pugil sticks are big padded things, right. so you're not going to really do anything with one of those. And we had, like, football helmets on. So I just start kicking him in the head until his nose broke, and he passed out. <laughs> uh, and the drill sergeant says, okay, you, you learned your lesson, you solved your, so, your, your yeah. issues, and we had no more problems with him. You were prepared well to be a soldier. I, you know... That was not so much about military stuff as it was about personal stuff. <laughs> there was there was really no need for some of the harassment. You know, right. he'd sneak in the barracks and turn over everybody's beds and rip all the sheets off and put them in a pile just right. because right. he could. You know. Yeah. In 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Yes. The civil rights movement were at at its peak, mm -hmm. and there were a great deal of inequality in America at that point. Mm -hmm. And then you were drafted and sent to fight in Southeast Asia for this country. What were you feeling uh, at that time? Uh, dismay. You know, uh, the spring of 68 was a really hard year for African Americans. And uh, my university, Ohio University in Athens, um, I went to undergrad there, and the school was closed down. Uh, because of demonstrations and racial strife and things like that. And then uh, the following summer, uh, I got drafted and knew that I was on the way to Vietnam to, uh, as, as the government then said, to defend the, the uh, democratic regime in South Vietnam, ensure that those people had their rights. And... Uh, I was dismayed. I was angry. When I was in training in Louisiana, we went out for beers. Right. We got a weekend pass. And uh, two of the guys at our table were black. Right. The waitress brought everybody a beer except us. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
And, you know, one, we were there having beer because we were going to, one of the guys, one of the, the other black guy was uh, a friend of mine from Cleveland, and he was going to Vietnam in two days. Right. Were you guys in uniform at this bar, or just civ civilian clothes? In or uniform. Uniform. In <laughs> uniform, indeed. And um, there was one guy there named Steve Bainey, and he was one of my, he was one of my favorite friends right. when I was in training. He was a white guy. I think he was from Tennessee. Right. And he asked the waitress, he says, you didn't bring these two men beers. And she said, we don't serve niggers. And he said, bitch, I didn't ask for niggers, I asked for beer. So it got, you know, the bouncer came over and things got a little testy. And um, we had to leave. <laughs> so, but, you know, I mean, the, the dance... That's the political background, the framework mm -hmm. for our arrival in Vietnam to spread freedom and democracy. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't didn't have it at home. Right, right. It, it's kind of sad in a way. It was. It was. Right. Now, um, in your book, um, one of the most memorable part for me when I was reading your book is your first day in Vietnam. Could you? Tell us more about your first day in Vietnam. What was it like? I was afraid. Um, that's probably an understatement. Uh, we landed at the replacement center at Camp Grand Bay. And that was, you know, landing there, just one plane full of guys, was characteristic of the Vietnam Army, and the, you know, Vietnam only army, a special institution. People finished training and you went to Vietnam basically alone. You didn't go with the unit you trained with. They would put you in a replacement center and wait until somebody had an opening and then they would send you out. So, you know, you could spend one day, a week, whatever. My first night in Vietnam, um, I had my, my first uh, military action. Somebody got into enclosed on one of those big fishing sandpans and it had a mortar on it, so they shelled the newcomer section. Right, right. So I really went through my first battle in Vietnam, hiding under a bed, waiting for it to be over. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, you know, I had no gun. Yeah, yeah. And you're not supposed to get gun until you're. First ten days in Vietnam. Uh, sometime around there, yeah. <laughs> and you know, on the bus to the replacement center, I sat next to an older, experienced sergeant, and you know, I said, "I got a problem here, man. Uh, when do we get a gun?" He said, oh, "Maybe in a week." And I wanted to open the window because it was just so hot and humid, mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. being trapped in a greenhouse. Right, right. And you couldn't open the windows because there were the big screens on the window. Mm -hmm. I said, what's with the screens? He said, it keeps grenades out. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, this is going to be a long year. <laughs> so, that, was, that was my first day. Wow, it was quite an experience. And you were, um, how old were you at this time? Uh, I was 22. 22. Mm -hmm. 22. That made me kind of one of the older guys in the mm -hmm. company. Um, mm -hmm. One of my nicknames uh, was Pops <laughs> at 22. And then you uh, continued your tour of duty, and later on you uh, landed in fighting in Cambodia. I did. Tell me why the war widened into Cambodia. Well, it was part of the American plan for withdrawal. Now, the North Vietnamese had a series of supply trails, generally known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they'd come south uh, from the northern part of Vietnam, swing west into Laos and Cambodia, and then come into Vietnam through the Central Highlands, uh, where I was stationed, actually. Right. So, as part of the withdrawal plan, it was decided that if we could get to their rest areas and hospitals and supply depots, uh, and destroy all of that stuff, then we could speed up the withdrawal, 
and it would leave our allies with the advantage. Right. You know, there's no sense coming to a gunfight if you don't have a gun. Right. right. So essentially, we were sent there to um, to rob. Yeah. And, you know, and, uh, them of as much of their supplies as we could get. So that's why we went to Vietnam. Okay. I, I'm sorry, to Cambodia. Cambodia. Mm -hmm.